right, thank you, Manny and Randy, for having me over today. Uh, fortunately, I'm on call, so if my phone rings, I apologize, but I may have to answer it. Um, so, I hope everybody finished their breakfast. I'm going to show you some surgical video, which I think is cool, and uh, you probably, as imagers, don't get a chance to see some of that. You're seeing more of the echo images, but I'll show you some intraoperative uh, video uh, of some valves. Um, tricuspid valve disease, very interesting disease. It's fascinating. Um, I don't think you need Barbara Bates uh, to show you how to do a jugular venous exam on this patient. If you see on the left side, this is a patient standing upright. So you can see the degree of tricuspid regurgitation in this patient. This is a before and after shot. Uh, before surgery is on the left, after surgery on the right. Um, and uh, I'll review some of the background anatomy, some of the concepts between primary, secondary tricuspid regurgitation, indications on treatment, and then some of the surgical principles and videos. So a lot of you know this anatomy on echo. Uh, gross anatomy, when we look at the tricuspid valve uh, here on the right side of the heart, you know it's uh, relationships to the fibrous structures of the heart, the septal leaflet, the anterior-posterior leaflet, uh, and its relationships to the mitral valve, the aortic valve, and the right coronary artery. And again through here, noting against the septal leaflet, the AV node bundle, uh, the aorta, the aortic valve, uh, and the mitral valve sitting here. And here again, the inside of the ventricle showing the subvalvular apparatus, uh, it's differences between the mitral valve um, that the two valves, the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve, are not in direct continuity. Um, and you can see the papillary structures um, associated with the tricuspid valve here. So the tricuspid valve is three-dimensional. It's not a flat valve. Um, it's got three-dimensionality to it. When we see tricuspid valve disease, mainly in the form of tricuspid annular dilatation, we see in this image the direction to which the valve dilates, and that really is based on the free wall of the right ventricle. So, some of the other, again, some of the, this highlights again just the directionality of the tricuspid annular dilatation, mainly along the anterior and posterior regions of the valve, along this uh, commissure here. Um, not so much in this region of the valve, which again is intimately associated with the fibroskeleton and mainly held in place. So, primary versus secondary. Primary really involves a primary problem with the valve, the leaflets, the annulus. Um, the subvalvular apparatus, and a lot of times when we're seeing uh, perforation, we're seeing them um, in the context of either trauma or endocarditis, uh, which is uh, perforated the leaflet. Prolapse we can see uh, in tricuspid valve disease in myxomatous valves. Sometimes you see these in patients with Barlow's disease. You also see severe enlargement of the tricuspid apparatus. Um, traumatic injury. Or we know that you can have a traumatic injury to the valve. Some of it is acute and presents very rapidly. Some of it is non-acute, meaning it can show up 15, 20 years down the road um, and uh, something that's progressive in its development. Rheumatic, of course, rheumatic uh, disease can also affect the, the tricuspid valve, carcinoid congenital, such as Epstein anomaly, and of and I think one of the biggest things that we're going to see here uh, in the coming days are going to be iatrogenic, and mainly to uh, pacemaker leads and ICD leads, which I'll show you an example of later. So functional tricuspid uh, regurgitation, uh, really a term popularized in the 50s to really differentiate primary versus secondary. So functional implies that it's secondary to most often a, a left-sided heart disease. Um, and the thought was that once you fix the left-sided heart disease, the tricuspid valve will fix itself. Uh, so some of the mechanisms that would be involved in generating functional TR, pulmonary hypertension, uh, the higher the pressures that the right ventricle has to pump against, the more the valve may dilate. 
papillary muscle displacement from uh, right ventricular enlargement and certainly annular dilatation. If you notice the annulus of the valve, and I'll show you an image of it, is very thin and delicate and again as the RV dilates it will pull the annulus with it. So in general surgeons have often not wanted to operate on the tricuspid valve uh, and there's a lot behind that um, but I was going to go through some of the myths and some of the reasons why your surgeon may send a patient with mitral disease and there's tricuspid disease but they didn't do that as well at the time of surgery so why not why why would a surgeon not operate on the tricuspid valve um, so one being that well moderate tricuspid regurgitation is fairly is a fairly benign disease um, and we know from the study by NATH, which was um, published in 2004, showing that there is some correlation between the degree of tricuspid regurgitation uh, and long-term survival uh, in, these group of in this group of patients here. So correcting left-sided lesions cures the functional TR. Um, and this, this was done in the 60s um, where mainly patients with rheumatic disease, once you fix the rheumatic valve on the left side of the heart, the right-sided tricuspid regurgitation would get better. And certainly pressures went down, systolic right ventricular pressures, and, and so did pulmonary pressures decreased. Um, and so the thought was that if you leave that alone, it will correct itself over time. Um, but further studies, and even more recent studies, uh, have shown that there is progressive uh, tricuspid regurgitation and the percentage of patients over time that start off with mild or moderate TR uh, may progress over the years to come. Again, curing MR does not cure tricuspid regurgitation. So tricuspid repair increases mortality and morbidity so you know don't touch it, uh, stay away from it, uh, the patient will do a lot better. Uh, I think this is a misconception um, I probably do somewhere around 60% of my tricuspid, my mitral valves, uh, I do tricuspid repairs on. It's a bit aggressive, but I have not seen increased mortality or morbidity in, the, in that group of patients. Um, and there are other groups that have reported the same thing. A, a more recent study by Chikwe has also uh, shown this, that there is no increased mortality with tricuspid valve surgery at the time of mitral surgery. Um, and I think the classic thing is as surgeons, we're seeing an echo intra-op and the anesthesiologist tells us, you know, there's trace TR, so don't bother chasing it. Um, well, we know that under general anesthesia, uh, you will see a decrease in the amount of TR because it, it has physiologic effect, effects which will lead to less flow through the valve or, or the pressures and volume changes through the valve, which would show the TR as being less at the time of surgery under anesthesia. So when do we actually, what are our indications? What are our surgical indications for it? These are American Heart Association guidelines um, showing progressive functional TR. In other words, not severe TR, mild to even moderate. What type of what other valves do you know of that you could actually intervene on with only mild or moderate um, disease or regurgitation? It's really only this valve here. But at the time of left-sided valve surgery, if you see the tricuspid annulus being enlarged, you have a 2A indication for intervention on that valve. Patients with pulmonary hypertension without tricuspid annular dilatation, they give a 2B. Certainly in asymptomatic severe uh, TR patients for functional TR at the time of left-sided valve surgery, um, that gives you a class 1 indication and a class 2B for, excuse me, for progressive RV dysfunction uh, and in the, in the role of severe symptomatic TR, you see reoperations with preserved right ventricular function or pulmonary hypertension that's not severe, a 2B indication at the time of left-sided valve surgery. Um, again, a class one indication. Um, what about patients with severe TR without indications for valve, other valve uh, surgery? And they gave that a two-way indication. So somebody with severe TR 
uh, without another valve indication for a procedure. So, no, there may be some argument. How do you measure the annulus? I'll leave that up to Randy to decide. Uh, but, you know, this is one view. This is one author's view is that the tricuspid annular diameter should be measured uh, in the preoperative transthoracic echo on the apical four chamber view in diastole. Um, and anything, certainly less, anything more than 40 to 45 millimeters would be considered significant. So how do we approach the tricuspid valve? Um, some of the surgical principles, we got to gain exposure to the valve. We have to look at the leaflets, make sure we understand the anatomy, the reasons for the dysfunction of the valve. We need to stabilize the annulus, and I'll show you how we do that, and avoid conduction injury. So these, this is the right atrium. Typically, this is done with bicable cannulation from the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava. Um, and once you open the right atrium, you could either open it horizontally, vertically. Uh, you gain exposure to the valve. Um, so once you're there, seeing the valve, how do you fix it? So there are annular plication uh, was historically used. Reduction annuloplasty and remodeling annuloplasties. These are um, more, these are flexible uh, bands. These are rigid bands or rings uh, that are used in the tricuspid position. These are some of the annular uh, plication sutures that were done. The K repair effectively uh, gets rid of that posterior leaflet. So you're bringing the anterior posterior commissure down to the uh, septal posterior commissure together and you're effectively bicuspidizing the valve. Um, so cons to this, you reduce the valve area obviously, uh, but there is late dilation um, and return of regurgitation, uh, mainly due to progressive annular dilatation in this region of the valve. This is called the, this is the De Vega repair, uh, more, more um, akin to where we place the annular devices, the rings, uh, but these again are sutured uh, through and through. This is a modified De Vega repair um, and really uh, mainly been shown to, to not be good long term in patients with severe annular dilatation. So typically we would use uh, annular devices such as rings or bands and again the difference between flexible bands and rigid bands are mainly due to the surgeon preference, the type of anatomy, the degree of dilata dilation uh, and there are a combination of the two uh, that I'll show you an example. So this is I think going to be something that we see commonly uh, as surgeons, patient with severe TR um, and has had a previous ICD or previous pacemaker lead, and you're seeing a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. So this is a 78-year-old male um, who had a defibrillator placed for ventricular tachycardia. He's had a previous cabbage in the past. Uh, generator change, they had to put a new lead in there, and after this, the second lead was placed in there, about six months later, becomes progressively more and more short of breath. He had abdominal and lower extremity edema, treated medically, now shows up in the office. His echo shows the BRTR, uh, but now looks better on, on a large doses of diuretics. So do we leave this person alone? Do we operate on them? It's a reoperation, right ventricular dysfunction. He's had previous contusion to the right ventricle. Um, so these are our high-risk procedures, and we go through them very carefully. Um, in this case, during surgery, you can see the intraoperative TE, and you can see the two leads here, the pacemakers, and severe TR. This is the intraoperative view. So here are the two leads, two pacemaker leads, the Swan-Gans catheter. The surgical anatomy here is a little difficult, but this is the septal leaflet down here. The posterior leaflet has been tethered and, and pulled into the, to the right ventricle, and the anterior leaflet is up top. So you can see now two leads, and you saw the erosion of the septal leaflet by, uh, by these leads. Lots of ventricular dilatation. You can see lots of tethering of the valve. That's the septal leaflet. 
there, and you see the posterior leaflet being really tethered and pulled into the ventricle. These procedures you can do with the heart beating. So you don't need to have ischemia time. Somebody who already has right ventricular dysfunction or failure, the last thing you want to do is cross clamp the heart and use ischemia time to repair this valve. So I do all of mine on a beating heart, even with left-sided valve disease, you can take the clamp off and do the right-sided valve. So this is the ring that we use for sizing. We base these little notches there, are, are to, um, you line those up against the septal posterior commissure and the septal anterior commissure here. And so you get a sense of how much the valve is dilated beyond where the ring is going to be. So when you put your sutures in, you then implant the ring. This is an MC3 ring. This is a very rigid ring. Um, you can see how it's pulled, cinched the valve together. You obviously want to be careful because this is the conduction area of the heart here. And the problem with these rigid rings is that you have to put them very close to the conduction system. Um, and because they're, they're really rigid in this region, uh, they have a higher incidence of dehiscence. Uh, and these were placements of the epicardial leads um, after, after surgery. And this is the, the post-operative view. So this is something that's more commonly seen, I think, in, in, in the setting of mitral valve disease. Um, you can see how the annulus is not circular anymore. It's become very stretched and oval. Um, so this is a very large valve. Um, again, septal leaflet here, anterior leaflet here, and the septal leaflet right here. And you put your sutures in, and then you're going to want to size it. So this is a relatively large valve. You can see these notches here for the commissure, the intercommissural uh, areas on the septal leaflet. And you can see how much that valve will be downsized. So you also measure the, the length of the anterior leaflet. So with those, we then put our sutures in and we know that this is the ring size. This particular ring is called a triad ring. So it's a combination of a flexible ring and a rigid remodeling ring. So the rigid portion is really only in the area that tends to have more dilation along the right ventricular side. And the flexible regions stay along these regions here, which are more, have more 3D, three, three dimensionality to it um, and are obviously closer to the conduction system. So you have a combination of the two rigid and uh, flexible portions for these particular cases. So what are the methods of failure that we see in tricuspid valve disease? One is not using an annuloplasty device. We can't use these K or DeVega uh, sutures unless you're in a place where, where you just don't have that available to you. Uh, but in the United States, there's no reason why we can't use uh, rings uh, or annuloplasty devices uh, rather than these um, K or DeVega repairs. Oversizing, fearing that you're going to incur tricuspid stenosis by putting in a small ring is another method of failure. The 26 ring, uh, typically in most size people, will not lead to tricuspid stenosis. Um, and that's the smallest ring that we have. Um, but we tend to oversize these rings. And that, of course, um, leads to more failure because you're not bringing those leaflets together enough for coaptation. Progressive ventricular remodeling, uh, obviously that can happen. Progressive left-sided valvular disease that recurs um, or, or, or other reasons for right ventricular dysfunction uh, can lead to further remodeling of the right ventricle and the TR to come back. And obviously pacemaker leads. If you do a repair with a pacemaker lead there, you're more apt to get recurrence uh, then if you take the lead out, put it on the surface of the heart, or you can take the lead and put it in a different area, such as the coronary sinus to base the heart. Um, so in summary, aggressive strategy for tricuspid repair at the time of initial mitral valve surgery may reduce the incidence and burden of late TR um, in patients with mitral valve disease uh, and is supported in the guidelines. 
ring angioplasty gives more stable and long-term results to, than suture techniques. Um, and these new remodeling rings uh, and combinations of flexible and rigid rings, I think, will help move the field forward. Thank you. Super, super. Thanks very much.